Star Spangled. Written and narrated by Butterfly Coffee and produced for audio by Mr. Judge. Another day dawned bleak at Newton Abbott. Grey clouds hung low in the sky and light mist clung to the air. The station was still recovering from its latest raid, with bits of station and engine debris scattered over pothole tracks, some of which turned upwards like sharpened, broken fingers. As the women finished firing the engines, the crews arrived to check them over. Once again, it seemed, they were full of chatter. More news must have come through on the radio. What about it, eh? Now the bloody Japs want to go! Just don't believe it. Oh? Well, I'll bet you they'll have something to say about this. What? What are you nattering on about this time? Asked Hercule in a drowsy voice. His driver turned to the 4200 with angry excitement. It's the Japanese! They've gone and bombed Pearl Harbor out in the Pacific! Hundreds of men dead and battle cruisers lost! It's just unthinkable! How horrible! Duchess exclaimed. I tell you, they've angered a sleeping bull, growled the fireman. You want my opinion? said another. Maybe this will tell them to finally get off their backside and start fighting with us like a proper allied should. Instead of sitting back and quietly supplying us, almost as bad as cowardice that is. Careful there, John, said a cleaner who was brushing Lizzie's boiler. We might have surrendered long ago if we didn't have those supplies coming in. Never mind those supplies. They've got to wake up if they're going to be fighting a double-ended war. You mark my words, something will be done. They can't sit back this time. In his office, Mr. Turner found himself going through paperwork and telegrams from last week. All this work piling up and no time to buckle down and do it. As he finished signing off a form, there was a knock at his door. He beckoned the stranger to enter, and the booking clerk came in with her big book and a few letters. Good morning, Mr. Turner. Some little letters for you, and a governmental directive. Oh, good grief. Uh, the Shedmaster mumbled. Uh, thank you, Nelly. He replied aloud. Also, sir, the clerk stated, placing her book on the desk and flipping through its pages. Crews have been reporting problems with engines 5027 from the Midlands, 5322 and 4722. They say they don't raise steam properly, and particularly with 5322, there is a lot of rocking and banging noises. They even say that 5322 is rough to handle at high speed. Well, that to be her bearings almost melted. Mr. Turner said as he read through the scribbled cursive. He muttered something under his breath before speaking properly again. We, we, we can't afford three more of our goods engines down. We'll have to make space in the workshops as soon as possible. It seems as though the evidence contradicts you, sir, the clerk said bluntly. I should also add that this is a network-wide problem. You are aware that goods are highly targeted by the Germans, with 5027 just shy of becoming another loss. I know Mr. Stanya would not let you hear the end of that. Yes, yes, I'm well aware of that, Nelly. Mr. Turner grumbled, handing the book back to the clerk and looking up at her. What do the men expect me to do about it? I, I can't just ship them off to be repaired when other stations and locomotive works are struggling to survive themselves. I'm afraid I don't know, Mr. Turner, sir, said the booking clerk. I suppose that information will be provided in the directive. I'll see myself out. Good day. And with that, she left, clicking the door shut behind her. Mr. Turner grumbled and ran a hand through his hair before tearing open a telegram envelope marked Newton Abbott MPD, Shedmaster Turner. Governmental Directive, Classified Information. A few months later, Joe and Hercule were taking stopping goods to Plymouth. Usually, Hercule could manage happily on his own. But ever since Mr. Turner had received the information from the booking clerk, he had been supplementing his engines wherever he could, until those under repairs came back. 
Hercule was thankful for the help, as he'd not been repaired for some time and was frequently beginning to struggle with his work. Joe, on the other hand, had not worked with Hercule before, so was reluctant to speak unless directly spoken to. The industrial much preferred to put his head down and get on with whatever he was asked to do. The two were making good headway when Hercule's driver spotted a signal set to danger. The train slowed to a halt and the two engines waited for the oncoming traffic to pass. They waited and waited, but nothing really happened. The two tank engines just sort of sat there. Both new delays were common since the war's outbreak, but there had been no raid for a few days. Hercule grew impatient. Come on, he called. See the box ain't bombed. You can see the ruddy thing from here. Feels strange to stand around dithering like this, wondered his fireman. They soon got their answer. A hoarse but soft sounding noise was heard in the distance, followed by a harried puffing. As the puffing became louder, Hercule and Joe heard that noise again. They wanted to think it was a whistle, but it was unlike any whistle they'd ever heard. Sounds more like a tugboat than an engine, Joe mumbled to himself. Both engines suddenly stared on in shock, as one after the other, came a long line of locomotives steadily forging past them. It wasn't uncommon for an engine to have steam pipes or handrails here and there on the boiler or smoke box, but these ones had so many, they were more akin to having sewage pipes stuck on them. They also had a tall dome each, tiny looking wheels, and long bogey tenders. Another chorus of whatever that noise was hollered again, and Hercule and Joe also heard a little loud jostling amongst the engines as they trundled past. The two struggled to find words for a short time. Well, said Hercule at last. Never heard such a sound before. Well, it looks like the cavalry's there, Joe remarked. But why so many? I've never seen so many engines move in one go before. Hercule started thinking to himself. Something about those engines seemed very familiar in a distant sort of way. He couldn't quite remember how. As the signal clunked down and they set off again, the 4200 mumbled to himself in an effort to remind himself where he might have seen or heard of engines like those before. Tall guns, long tenders, and tiny wheels. Awful lot of noise. Up there in the front of a flag on him. And tenders had some, some letters on them. U.S. Hercule suddenly stopped talking staring blankly ahead, as everything made sense. Oh no! Oh no, no, no! The large tank engine started laughing to himself, but not because something was funny. It was more like he was laughing to ward off something else. Uh, Hercule? Joe called. Is everything alright back there? Hercule smothered his laughter. Let's just say we won't be alright when we get back to Newton Abbott, alright? Why? Who are those engines? Trust me, we'll most likely be going home to find a war zone within a war zone. Oh, well, Lizzie is never going to be quiet when she finds about this. Hercule, what are you talking about? What's going on? The 4200 only said one word in a voice that commanded a looming sense of dread. Yanks. Hercule was right. People crowded the platform and were talking all at once, whilst a small crowd were gawping at a group of engines in Platform 9. Joe immediately recognised them as engines from the cavalcade he and Hercule had passed earlier. But of course, the loudest noise came from the engine shed. Lizzie was blowing off steam left, right and centre, looking thoroughly annoyed. 
The 4200 and the industrial could hear what she was saying as they edged closer. Run! Cheaply strapped each and every Sunday 1 a.m. I can make better out of a telegraph pole. And I have no sodding hands! Neither are my crew carpenters! And also, who in their right mind would strap a motor car grill to the front of an engine? Who does that? Who ever thought that was a good idea? Or to be thrown into Dark Horse Prison with the Comfies, I tell you this now! Cheap, fat buggers, a lot of them are! Hello, 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 all, said Hercule sweetly, coming to a stop outside the sheds. I suppose your ranting and raving gives it all away, eh, Lizzie? Had a bad lot with the Yanks last time round, did you? Lizzie harumphed loudly. Dirty, rude, unfocused things. So ugly, too, Louise cooed in disgust. Look at all those steam pipes. So ungainly. The concept of elegance and functionality is practically lost on them. Everyone was soon silenced as Mr. Turner approached the engine sheds. His head hung a little low, and he seemed to stoop, as if in the shadow of the man walking behind him. He looked important, dressed in a smart-looking suit with lots of belts and medals. He stared hard at every engine under the brim of his cap. Duchess, Hercule, and Lizzie could hold his stare, but Caitlin, Joe, and Louise could not. The man cleared his throat, a deep growl of a sound. Well, Turner, if you say this is your best, then I'd hate to see what your worst is. They all look like this about to fall apart. It's a good thing my boys brought some of our own over here. They're all fine engines within their own right, Sergeant. Mr. Turner replied tightly. He must have disliked this man as much as his engines did. They've survived numerous air raids and kept largely to time. One of them will even be twice a veteran when this war is finished and done with. The Shedmaster turned to address his locomotives. I'm sure you're all curious to know what's happening. I, along with the station masters up and down the country, have received a governmental directive in which details an influx of the engines from our American allies to supply our goods locomotives. Apparently, our railway alone is taking over 160 of these new arrivals. Perfectly dreadful, hissed Louise. Before Mr. Turner could talk any more, the man in the suit had barged past him and stood to attention. That there's where I come in. My S-160s are built for the job of helping you old sad sacks out in this here fight. You hear? Sad sacks indeed, Hugh Duchess. My name is Sergeant Isaac Kant of the United States Army Transportation Corps, but you will address me as Sir. Is that understood? Lizzie suddenly sniggered, not bothering to keep herself in check. Sergeant Hunt frowned deeply. Is something funny, little lady? He asked in a low voice. Oh, no, no, chuckled Lizzie. <clears throat> Sorry, but what did you say your name was? My name is Sergeant Isaac Cunt. <laughs> the sergeant was cut off by the mogul bursting into fits of laughter. I beg pardon, it's my old age, I suppose, but what was your name again? Lizzie asked, grinning widely. I said my name is Sergeant Isaac Hunt, and you- <laughs> This time, the mogul didn't even attempt to hold back. She was practically in tears with how hard she was laughing. The other engines, and Mr. Turner, just stared. What was so funny? No, no, please, please, it's my hearing. Lizzie practically wheezed. <laughs> what, what was the name again? Sergeant Isaac Hunt, growled the sergeant. And you will address me as sir at all times, Joker Motive. Is that clear? Everyone was shocked at the man straight up yelling at Lizzie like that. Even the gaggle of S-160s were looking on in horrified awe. The 4300 simply gave the sergeant a smile, her eyes dark. Of course, she responded deliberately not addressing him as sir. You disrespectful, disobedient piece of... 
Sergeant Hunt drew himself very straight and puffed out his chest, taking a step towards Mr. Turner. I would like to have a word with you, Turner. He spat. Y'all have some locomotives that need to be scrapped at best and court-martialed at worst. And I'd especially like to talk about this here cabbage-faced mogul. Back in the States, engines that are past their prime are scrapped and melted down for the war effort. Before striding away to the station building, Mr. Turner silently groaned, but turned to his engines again. The S-160s will make our work a damn sight easier than it is now. So I trust you all, and I mean all, he said, shooting Lizzie a warning look. Make them and Sergeant Hunt feel welcome. They have a job to do here, and that is to help us win this war. And he wearily followed after the sergeant's distant figure. The engines were very quiet for the longest time. Was Britain having to turn to the Americans for help? Is that how bad the war was now? Lizzie didn't think so. We were managing all right. I don't see why the Yanks have to turn up and start fiddling with things. Falling apart. Those S1 zingy McGummies look like they can barely stay together themselves. That's another thing about Yanks. What they build isn't built to last. As vocal as you are tonight, Lizzie, interrupted Duchess calmly, we must see what our crews think of them before we make any real opinions known. They're the ones who will be handling them after all. Well, I'll make mine known now, Lizzie said boldly. Just because they've swooped in at the last minute, don't expect me to be grateful for it. I know where I stand on the subject of American anything. And that so-called sergeant of theirs, shuddered Louise. What a vile devil of a man. Just awful. I agree. What an absolute dirty steaming great big chuntering Lizzie, cried Duchess aghast. What's your language? There are younger engines, eh? Hercule reminded, quickly glancing to Joe and Caitlin, who were still reeling from the entire thing. We know you're a bit upset, but simmer down a bit, would you? What? I was going to call him a twit. The engines were more than thankful for that. Lizzie was thankful they didn't hear her mutter a final few words under her breath. Fuck, constable of... What? Did you think I was going to be impressed, or scared, or amazed by these things? Get stuffed, you Yankee pandering sods, and let me sleep. 